Um, we're going to be looking at Second Chronicles uh, chapter 13 today. Uh, but before we do that, I want to say a few things. Um, first thing I want to say is, as I was just praying <laughs> there, I just want to give God glory. I mean, here we are, guys, you know? Here we are. We're healthy. We're well. Here we are. We're, we're, we're pulling, moving out of this lockdown situation. And I just give God glory for that. I give God glory that there are no new cases of COVID-19 in Northern Ireland. I give God glory that there are no new deaths. As far as I know, I give God glory that He is setting us free, that He has freed us from this thing, this merchant of death in Jesus' mighty name. We give you glory for that, Lord. You and you alone. Lord, we thank you for the health workers. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for those who make wise and sound decisions. We thank you, Lord, for all the experts for it. But above all we give you the glory because they don't have any expertise or ability that you haven't given them <laughs> lord and you're the expert of experts no one has got this better than that so we give you glory amen i just want to say guys it's so important that we keep doing this um you know even the experts as i said from the beginning don't know don't know what to do I don't mean that in a, in a critical way. I'm saying they don't know. It's they, they, they have their very intelligent guesses about what they're doing, but they don't know. Should it be two meters? Should it be one meter? Should it be mask or no mask? Should be, you know, should schools be shut or should they be open? There's so many different, for everything you read that says, this is what we should be doing. Another article comes out and says, well, actually, this is what we should be doing, okay? They're just people are just trying to do the best they can, and I understand that. But God knows. God knows. And he has authority over all these things. And I just want us to, I want us to just give him glory. You know, I just want to, I just, I'm bursting with just gratitude and thankfulness. Do you realize that um, it's been announced that uh, as of uh, a week from tomorrow, um, the whole actual church thing comes back into being and it's up to the churches to decide what they can manage in terms of you know um, of, of, of people and that sort of thing um, and, and social distancing and all that stuff so i get my glory for that um it's a wee bit cheeky that it's on a monday but it <laughs> God bless it being. um uh, but that's okay because actually i want to announce anyway and i'll be sending this out in text that i have to work um all next weekend, I'm going to take an online, a virtual leadership course online uh, for the for the, the Navy thing. So I'll be doing that, um, and, and so there's no meetings next weekend. Okay, um, and then the following weekend we'll, we'll we'll either be in here or we'll be out there, depending on the Lord. Um, so anyway, I was just out there in the street while we were worshiping, and um, I feel like I sense I'm sensing that people are becoming already <laughs> satisfied again, and and this concerns me. Uh, this concerns me because you know the Lord allows things like COVID nineteen. He allows not of the Lord; it's of the enemy. But the Lord allows it because he brings he works all things together for good and because he wants to stir people up his church as well as the world so that they're thinking wait a minute this is chaos this is craziness this is what we've never seen before maybe i should be thinking about some more important things but like where i came from where i'm going and um yeah so and you've really been seeing that as we've been doing street ministry throughout the the, the pandemic and the lockdown We've been doing the street ministry, and you've just seen people just desperate for prayer, desperate for a touch. Even people who don't believe, oh, please do bless me. Yes. I don't believe, me. yes, please do pray a blessing over me. Um, and that's powerful because people are in that place of, uh, of vulnerability, you see, and that's when the Holy Spirit can break through into their hearts. Because vulnerable hearts are open to the Holy Spirit, um, but satisfied and uh, content uh, and uh, hearts that are just, you know, happy with the way things are, tend not to be. Um, and I have to be honest, I kind of get the sense out there that that's, we're already shifting back into that place. Um, and so what I want us to, to, to understand as a church is that we 
need to be looking for, as I've been saying, we need to understand about the beginning of the birth pangs, and there's more birth pangs coming, and we need to be stirring up our brothers and sisters, but also the world, um, to understand um, that, you know, as these things build, it is mercy that the Lord is allowing them so that people won't just go back to the way they were, won't just go, oh, well, I guess, you know, my, my social distancing, you know, um, saved, saved me, and I guess, um, you know, the, the, the NHS um, is what got us through it. God bless the NHS, but it is the power, the power, the power, the wonder-making power of the blood of Jesus that has set us free from this thing, um, and, and it will set us free from anything that comes if we cry out. And so let us have hearts that continue to cry out. Let us have hearts that continue to not be just either, you know, satisfied or just, oh, yeah, that's good enough. Or the hearts that forget what our God has done for this, for us, for he is mighty. And so often when you look at the history of the Lord's people, so often, time and time again, God will come in and in spite of all the, 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 the sin and idolatry, would come in with such mercy and save and rescue them out of their predicament, the predicament that they were in because of their idolatry and their rejecting their Father in Heaven, their Creator, their Rescuer, their Savior, their Redeemer, the one that bought them and took them out of Egypt and saved them with a mighty hand. Um, and they, as soon as they got saved, they again, every time they got rescued, they would just forget about it and go back to worshiping Him. We don't want to be this kind of people. But I want to look at a story today. Not that I'm suggesting we are, guys. But I'm suggesting that we need to be stirring one another up. Stirring the church up. Not to be, have eyes back on sort of, you know, what makes us comfortable and, and, and that sort of thing. And we need to be looking ahead and trusting in the Lord. So I want to look at uh, the Second Chronicles chapter 13 is a powerful, powerful display of what happens when on both sides, and what happens when a side <laughs> turns to the Lord and trusts in him to fight the battles, okay, and calls upon his name and gives him glory um, for who he is and what he's done, and honors him, and the other side that doesn't do that. <laughs> um, a very powerful picture, guys. And um, it, it, the story is about this uh, battle that takes place between, um, unfortunately, a, a civil war, if you will, that takes place between the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. And this is not long after um, the two kingdoms have split. Okay, this is when um, uh, Abi Abijah, who is the grandson of Solomon, comes into power. Okay, so his father was Rehoboam, and um, Rehoboam was, um, you know didn't follow the Lord, um, and, and it says in, in, in first, or, um, it's the first Kings, I think, where it tells the story about Elijah, um, it says that, that he, he did eat, he reigned three years in the evil on the side of the Lord. So on the whole, Elijah, he just like his father done. So on the whole, Elijah wasn't, wasn't who he was supposed to be, but he did this right, okay? He declared and he, the, the, the truth about who Yahweh God is, and he trusted in him to fight the battle, okay? Um, now, obviously, he didn't do other things, right? Um, so that's why it says that. Um, but it also says, actually, I should just turn it up. Hold your place there in, in Second Chronicles. I should probably just turn to this in First Kings 15, because this, what it says briefly, it only it doesn't tell the whole story I'm about to tell in Chronicles, but it just says briefly about him in chapter 15 of First Kings. Now, in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, of the son of Nebat, Abijah uh, became king over Judah. Um, he's called um, uh, Abijah in the uh, first kings, and he's called Abijah um, in what um, call it, in Second Chronicles. Uh, but oftentimes um, these names were interchangeable. So, um, in, it's what it says is in chapter fifteen of First Kings, um, he became king over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Makkah, the granddaughter of um, Abba Shalom, and, and he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. His heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem, 
by sending out his son after him and by establishing Jerusalem. Because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life. Okay, so that's what it says about him there. Um, in other words, God still blessed him because of his, his you know, his, he says his father did, but it would have been his great, his great grandfather too. Um, and so um, this is a powerful picture that we're going to see of how God blessed him and how at least in this case he declared the truth about who God is. Um, so this is in um, back to Second Chronicles chapter 13. Um, and I just want to read through this. Remember Jeroboam was the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel. Okay, he had been Solomon's servant, um, but, but um, then he, uh, Solomon was, was, was hard on him and he fled and then after Solomon died, he back and um it was a prophet for him um, that he would be a king that he that, that the lord would, would take 10 of the tribes away from from uh, the house of david and, and, and that he would give them to jeroboam um and god so god chose him and said come on you can do this well the instant he became king um he, he made two golden calves um because uh, he didn't want the northern kingdom people to go to jerusalem to worship worship because he thought that would strengthen jerusalem so he made two golden calves, set one up, I think, in Dan, one in Bethel, and said, okay, this is your God who uh, rescued you out of Egypt, worship the golden calves. Um, and, and so throughout then, you see that throughout the, the story of the, um, the Kings and Chronicles, the story of the northern kingdom of Israel, time and time again, it says, Jeroboam who had caused Israel to fall into sin. So this sin set up generationally idolatry, which was passed all the way down until until um, it, the northern kingdom of Israel was finally taken into captivity um, and, and just wiped out. Okay, I think it was in uh, 722 when you see that. Okay, so so you see how you see the generational impact of sin started with Jericho. He chose idolatry. Okay, and and that and that is something that stuck with uh, Israel throughout its existence, the northern kingdom. So anyway, um, Jericho. Um, now, after Jeroboam had become king, and Rehoboam would become king in, in the southern, taken over from his father Solomon, they, they were going to go to war straight away. The prophet came to Rehoboam and said, Don't do this, don't go to war. This, this is of the Lord. This is what he's done, okay, in, in separating these kingdoms uh, for his purposes and because of, because of Solomon's unfaithfulness in, in the issue of you know, bringing in the foreign wives and worshiping their gods. So um, the prophet said, But don't go to war. Okay, so that was that was the war between them was not of God, but by the time Jeroboam was still king, by the time and uh, Rehoboam died and Abijah came into power, and um, they did go to war together. Okay, so that's the context that we're looking at now. Let's read in Second Chronicles chapter thirteen, uh, from verse one. In the eighteenth year of King Jeroboam, Abijah became king over Judah. He, he reigned three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Micaiah, the daughter of Uriel of Gibeah. And there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam. Abijah set the battle in order with an army of valiant warriors, 400,000 choice men. Jeroboam also drew up in battle formation against him with 800,000 choice men. So, so Jeroboam, the northern kingdom, has twice as many men as the kingdom of Judah. Mighty men of valor. Verse 4, then Abijah stood on Mount Zemarim, which is in the mountains of Ephraim, and said, Hear me, Jeroboam, and all Israel. And this is powerful. This is where we get this declaration, okay, um, of, of who God is. Now he starts this declaration uh, by sort of accusing Jericho of, of, of just gathering together a bunch of worthless men and taking the northern kingdom, okay, um, which is a little bit self serving for, for Abijah to say, but then he moves into talking about God and this is the way things about God. So, should you not know, verse 5, that the Lord God of Israel gave the dominion over Israel to David forever to him and to his sons? By a covenant of salt. Yet Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, rose up and rebelled against his Lord. Then worthless robes gathered to him and strengthened themselves against Jeroboam, the son of Solomon. When Jeroboam was young and inexperienced, he could not withstand them. And now you think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord, which is in the hand of the sons of David, and you are a great multitude, and with you are the gold calves, which Jeroboam made for you as gods. Have you not cast out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron, and the Levites, 
and made for yourselves priests like the peoples of other lands, so that whoever comes to consecrate himself with a young bull and seven rams may be a priest of things that are not gods. You see, Jeroboam set that up as well, because all the priests went to Jerusalem. They didn't stay when, they, when these golden calves came, came about. They, they went to go worship and serve you know, the truth in, at the temple in Jerusalem. So what Jeroboam did is he chose whoever he said would be a priest got to be a priest. It wasn't the sons of Aaron and the Levites, okay, who did the service. It was anybody from any tribe, which again, of course, is strictly against um, the, 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 the old covenant of the law. Okay. Um, so, um, and so anybody who comes and just sort of bribes can be a priest. Verse 10, but as for us, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. And the priests who minister to the Lord are the sons of Aaron, and the Levites attend to their duties. And they burn to the Lord every morning and every evening, burnt sacrifices and sweet incense. They also set the showbread in order on the pure table, and the lampstand of gold with its lamps to burn every evening. For we keep the command of the Lord our God, but you have forsaken him. Now look, God himself is with us as our head, and his priests will sound in trumpets to sound the alarm against you. O children of Israel, do not fight against the Lord God of your fathers, for you shall not prosper. But Jeroboam caused an ambush to go around behind them. So they were in front of Judah, and the ambush was behind them. Okay, so take a pause there. The picture is, you know, he's declaring, here they are, you know, he's, he knows that Jeroboam is coming down against him, you know, to, to attack. So he goes to meet him, you know, in the mountains of the front. And do you understand what you're doing? You are serving the enemies of the Lord. You are serving demonic hosts. You are doing things the wrong way. Our, we still in Jerusalem are doing things the right way. That is true, although he wasn't a good king, okay? Things have not degraded to the point they will eventually, okay? But it was still the case that the that they were doing what they were supposed to be doing in the temple. The, the priests were still, you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing. The Levites were attending to their duties. They were doing the daily sacrifices. Eventually, all this just sort of peters out over the centuries, okay? It gets worse and worse and worse, and the moral degradation, the moral state worsens and worsens in Judah um, and in Jerusalem. But at this point, they were still priests and, and the Levites were doing what they were supposed to be doing. And so he's speaking the truth, and he says, we're, we're serving God the way he told us to serve him. Um, but you are, how can you possibly think that you are going to win a battle against us? And I want to stir us up guys, to realize that we can say the very same things to the enemies of the Lord. And I'm not talking about flesh and blood, okay? Because I know, yes, there are human enemies against you know us and against individually against you, know, you or against, you know, what, what this ministry does or against the church, I realize that, okay? But it is the spirits at work that we have been given authority over. It is the spirits at work that we are to bind and to crush and, and, to, and, and to trample um, according to the word of Jesus Christ and according to his, his you know, word, and the, the scriptural truth. You know, we don't wrestle against flesh and God. We don't wrestle against people. But the point is, we can say to the spirits that work in people or the spirits that work in, in, um, in geographic locations, in, in, in institutions, in whatever, we can say, do you realize what you are doing? We can have that righteous indignation, you see, that we are on the side of the right. Why? Because we're good? No, not because we're good, but because we are washed in the blood of Jesus, and he is good beyond measure. And he has given us out of his mercy and because of what he accomplished on Calvary. He has given us the authority, the power to trample serpents and serpents. That's what he's given us to do. And so we can be raised up. Now it's true, of course, that as I was talking about last weekend, you know, that if we're, if we're partnering with certain, you know, idolatrous or other kinds of spirits, if we're partnering with things that are not right, um, in our lives, things that are not of God. And then we're trying to, you know, you know, declare this and pray against these things. It's true that we're doing it with one hand but tied behind our back. We might have partial success or success for a time, but it's not going to be the fullness that we could be stepping into. And, and, and it's not about, you know, 
as I'm saying last week about rebuking you, it's not about like, oh, you should feel terrible. It's just about being so straightforward and honest with the Lord. Just go, Lord, that's in my life. I'm just, I repent of it. I don't want it. Lord, I reject it in Jesus' name. name. And the moment you do, you break that. You break the legal ground of that thing. And then you have the fullness of the authority. You've got both arms, as it were, to fight with. Um, and, and, to, and to just come against those um, those spirits that are at work. We have to understand when, you know, we should be daily, you know, letting the Lord shine his light of truth on us and, and, and repenting of whatever it is that the Lord is showing us. You know, and it will be specific, guys. It, you know, when the Lord, when the Holy Spirit, when he convicts, it's not like some general sense, oh, yeah, I think I sinned or something <laughs> yesterday. It's like, wow, wow, when you are in his presence and you have humbled yourself, and you open your heart to let him show you instantly. He shows you exactly what's been the work, the darkness, whatever it is. You know, that 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 irritableness, um, that judgment, condemnation, criticism, um, that, that you know, uh, divisiveness, that that gossip, that um, that anxiety and worry and fear that you part with, whatever it is, guys. And that's just a, a list of few things. <laughs> Whatever it is, he shows you anything. You instantly you see it, and you just you just are so just smitten because you're like, Lord, I know that's not of you, and I don't want it, and I hate it. And that's powerful. And we should be doing that every day. And if we're doing that, we get a, we we move on, and we 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 get freedom from those things, you know, um, as, as we allow him to show us, rather than. Sort of dusted it under the under the carpet, and then it just we get desensitized to it, and it just remains. So anyway, we can then, as we do that daily, then the Lord sends us out into the world to pray, okay, and to and to not necessarily you know by going in, but sometimes it'll be by going out to work. But the point simply is that He shows us things at work in the world, and we are to pray against those things, okay, and we can stand up and we can say, "How dare you!" We can just, we should have such righteous indignation. How dare you oppose the things of God? How dare you oppose me and my family? How dare you oppose his, his church and his people? How dare you? We just got a, 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 a prayer request today for, for you know, a, a young mother who's, who's just been smitten by a horrible attack of the enemy, cancer in, in, in her body, and she's, and she's got a, a one-year-old child, and she's got another one on the way. And if, she, if she can't be treated because the she, because that will affect, she'd have to abort the child to get the treatment. She's not going to do that. So, so we just need to get so angry. I mean, how dare this spirit of cancer? And make no mistake, it is a spirit. It is a spirit that needs to be ruthlessly crushed. And we can stand up and say, "What do you think you are doing? You have no right or authority to come against." This child of God, we can plead the blood of Jesus and we can trample. And that is such power, okay? Such power. And that's what Abijah is doing here, okay? He's, you know, in spite of his faults and his flaws, um, he is saying, what are you thinking? That you can even mount an attack and, and hope to win. And the second he says it, what happens? Does Jeroboam turn around and run? No. Jeroboam devises a cunning strategy, an ambush to hedge them in, the, the, the army of Judah on both sides, okay? And make no mistake, guys, it'll be sometimes the same. Sometimes, yes, when we pray in the power and authority, those things will flee straight away. Other times, you know, you'll think like, okay, I've just done this victorious prayer and, 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 and just stepped out on the, in the name of the Lord, you know, and Bam, instantly there's a, there's a comeback, there's a blowback from the enemy, whether again it's the people or whatever circumstances, and you're just like, whoa, okay, now that is not the time to falter or to grow faint, okay? <laughs> that is the time to cry out, yes, to the Lord, okay? But to remember, as we were talking about earlier, testify of how many times he's rescued you in the past when precisely the same thing has happened. How many times? I can think of so many times when I looked around me and I thought the enemy is all about me. There's nothing I can do here. He's cornered me in. There is no escape. I cry out. And he has 
rescued me. He has plucked me out of that situation. He has trampled my enemies. He has trampled my enemies. Okay, that is what he does. And we have to declare that and not lose hope. Okay, because some clients, some things get worse before they get better. Okay, but they will. But um, joy will come in the morning. Victory will come at dawn. Okay, that's what happens. Okay, so let's return to our story here. Um, and we're look, we're at verse uh, fourteen, I think. And when Judah looked around, to their surprise, the battle line was at both front and rear, and they cried out to the Lord, and the priests sounded the trumpets. <laughs> then the men of Judah gave. And as the men of Judah shouted, it happened that God struck Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. Do you get it? Do you see it? It's not about your 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 abilities, your strength, your 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 warfare capabilities, your your training. It's not about your nobility. It's not about your talents and your virtues. It's none of that. It's not about your training. It is none of those things. It is about the Lord. He is the one that won the victory for you and me on the cross while we were yet enemies of his. He did not need our help. He did not need our strength. <laughs> I'm using that in scare quotes. Our strength, such as it is. He did it on his own and by himself and everybody else fled him. Okay. And Jesus stayed true. He stayed true because he saw the joy set before him, and that was you, you, you. He saw you. He saw you. Perfected and reformed, transformed into his image and his servant for all eternity. He saw you, and he said, that's you. I'm willing to die for that. That's what he saw. Make no mistake, never, ever, ever take the personal element out of it. You've got to make it personal. Jesus saw you. He saw you. And he said, this is worth it. This is worth it. That's who it is that we serve. So when we are in that place of helplessness, and none of our, we will, none of our, we cannot call upon anything in ourselves. Oh, that is Holy Spirit, which is in ourselves. But you know what I mean? Anything that's of us, apart from him, anything that's of the old man, anything that's of the natural order, anything that's of the flesh, we cannot call upon it for our rescue. But we cry out. We cry out to him. We sound up it. You sound the trumpet. People think trumpets are for victory. <laughs> trumpets are to usher in the victory. <laughs> the shofar is to declare this is the victory, and the victory is coming, and the enemy is defeated, and the walls are fallen, and the enemy is getting crushed. That's what they're for. You don't wait to see if there's going to be a victory, and then after the victory, okay, let's just blow the trumpets. You blow them. When defeat is all around you and helplessness and hopelessness, you blow them because you know you have hope in the Lord. And that He is the one that fights your battles. So the men of Judah gave a shout. And as the men shouted, it happened that God struck Jeroboam and all this Israel before Abijah and Judah. And the children now fled before Judah, and God delivered them into their hand. Then Abijah and his people struck them with a great slaughter. So 500,000 choice men of Israel fell slain. Thus the children of Israel were subdued at that time, and the children of Judah prevailed because they relied on the Lord God of their fathers. That's how you prevail. It is because his church has relied upon him that we have prevailed over coronavirus. And if coronavirus tries to come back and to hedge us in on both sides, we will prevail again because of the power of the Lord, because we rely upon him. And whatever else is coming down the pike, 
we will prevail over that as well. I know I'm being repetitive about this, guys, but please be asking the Lord in this breathing space we're, we're coming into between this and the next thing. Please be asking the Lord to prepare you, to strengthen you. This is not, not a time, guys, for kicking back and saying, well, okay, now we can relax, okay? This is a time for pressing in, for understanding, for, 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 for um, revelation. What do you need next of me? Well, how do you need to be prepared, Lord, for that? Because I tell you guys, there are going to be things that come such as we've never seen before. And they are going to bring fear and, 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 um, and awe and amazement and wonder to the world. Okay? And we need to be not overcome in our spirits. We need to be standing and trusting and knowing that no matter what comes, we can grow those show drops. Whether we have our own or whether it's just in the spirit, we can shout. And he will rescue us every single time. Okay? Ask the Lord, guys. He will show you what he needs from you. He will show you. He will prepare you spiritually. And I've been preaching for several years now. Is extreme dependence. Extreme God dependence. And the complete end of self dependence. We need to be pressing in for more of that in the season that's going to be coming, guys. We need to be so extremely, radically God dependent. Not dependent on our own reason and imagination. Reason is a gift of God. Just let His Spirit use it, but do not hold it up in its own right as a thing that's going to allow you to work things out. We need revelation from the Lord, okay? And he will show you. Trust him, guys. And Abijah pursued Jeroboam, verse 19, uh, and took cities from him, Bethel with its villages, Cheshire with its villages, and Ephraim with its villages. So Jeroboam did not recover strength, and Abijah, the Lord struck him, and he died. So that was the end of Jeroboam. Okay. Is there anything more out of the attacks upon the people of the Lord that were actually doing what the Lord said to do? Now, on one hand, obviously, this is a terrible tragedy because the 500,000 choice men of Israel were God's people too. Okay. But the, 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 the lesson to us, the moral, the point for us is that then. Because of Jeroboam and his sin, because he caused all this from the sin, they were the enemies of the Lord. Because they came against the people who were actually following the commandments of God. Okay, They were the enemies of the Lord at that time. And when the enemies of the Lord come against his people who are doing what they're supposed to be doing, now, we know we're under the new covenant. Doing what you're supposed to be doing means something different now to us than it did to them. What it meant to them was keeping the whole law. But Peter and the apostles at the council in Jerusalem said, Men and brethren, if, if, we, were, if we and our fathers weren't able to keep this law, how could we ask the Gentiles to do it when Jesus has died and made a way? for us to be free of that, okay? So what we need to be doing is what Jesus does, is what Jesus says to do, okay? What we need to be doing is what the New Testament tells us to do, which is to follow the Spirit of the law. With Jesus, what I believe the Spirit of the law is, is we the two commandments that Jesus says are above everything that we and all the law the prophets have to do. To love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. If we're doing that, that means we're putting Jesus first in our lives before anything else. If we're doing that, that means we're loving the world the way that Jesus loved us. Okay? And everything, all the rest that Jesus says to do falls in those things. Okay? And so, 
when we're doing that, we're being, we're being filled daily with the Holy Spirit. That's a part of that too. We're repenting. Yet, not only the power of the blood, you know, deep down in areas that we can't even touch, but we're receiving it in our conscience self as well. And so that our conscience is white and pure, not because we've done no wrong, but because we are cognizant of the power, the washing power, working power of the blood to make us shine the spark. Okay? As we're doing all these things, guys, no matter what God allows for Satan to bring against us, he will give us the victory. And it will be for his name's sake and for his glory. Okay? So we can trust, we can declare but we have to be so in tune with what he's doing in this season in us. We have to be so ready to go, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. Not, it was, you know, it was so my heart to be out on my beach today, praying and worshiping and preaching, okay? But nevertheless, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. We don't always know why. His desire today was for us to be in here online the way we are, okay? And there will be appointed seasons and appointed times for all these other things, guys. And I don't care. I don't care as long as his will is being done. As long as his will is being done, guys. He can do whatever he wants to do. He wants to stir us up sometimes. You know, he can put he may Make something grievous to us in order for us to be in tune with his will, but exactly who's in tune. And then he wants us to step out in that way, okay? But that's why we always say, Your will be done. Your perfect will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Remember, guys, the reason we pray that is because why is heaven heaven? Why is heaven all the wonderful things that we know it to be, that we know it will be? We know it is when it comes to earth as it does. We know it is when he uses us to bring it to earth as he does. And we know it will come in its fullness and we will be forever, ever, and ever in that place of absolute joy. No matter what happens, it's going to be absolute peace and joy and goodness such as we could never be. Okay, forever. Why is that? Happening? Why is that? Happening? Because God's perfect will is always being done. <laughs> it's always being done. Nothing is out of His will. His perfect will. Now we know on earth He allows stuff to happen, so nothing, in a sense, on earth is out of His will either. But it's not His perfect will. It's what. Theologians sometimes call it permissive will. It's what he allows to happen so that he can bring all things together for good. Okay? But his perfect will would be, you know, that the whole world would be saved. <laughs> but then he would have to force people to be saved. And they wouldn't have freedom to do otherwise. And it's worth it more to him to allow his people to choose to us with a little heart. Okay? So, but when we get to heaven, there's nothing in anybody's heart but what is God's will. And I've preached before about how it can still be the case that that's not, that's still freedom. <laughs> and the way it's still freedom is that we will only be doing in heaven to the extent that we allow him to have his will in our lives. This is where we choose. We get the free choice to choose how much of God's will and glory we will allow for him to do in us and through us. This is what we choose. And then it's not a lack of freedom in heaven when we're always doing his will. But if we only allow him to do a little tiny bit in us here, then for all eternity he can't do a lot with us there. Because that would be his will. <laughs> So the extent to which we allow him to do here is the extent that he can use us there for eternity. Okay? Think about that. <laughs> Think 
Think about that. The next thing you know, I'm going to what God's will in this case. Because my will has got something pretty good in mind, and I would prefer that. <laughs> and you just. Of course. <laughs> Unless you say, you know what? I want your perfect will, even if it's that. <laughs> even if it's that. That's powerful. Again, these are revelations that if we really got them, Satan could just could never have a hate with us. He could never have his way with us. Everything you're throwing at me, I'm just allowing God's perfect will to be done. And you know what? It's I've got more glory than heaven has it. So right. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna close there, guys. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, I just give you glory for your mighty word and the truth that is in it. Truths that we can use now and today, Lord, when we truths about relying upon you to fight our battles for us to shouting, Lord Jesus, in the spirit, Lord, Lord, with authority, with absolute certainty, even when we're surrounded on all sides, absolute certainty that you will rescue us that you will defend, that you will crush our enemies, Lord, that you will fight our battles because you're mighty to save, you're mighty to set free, and we love you. We trust you, we declare it for now, Lord, that we trust you. We give you glory for this, this coming out of the lockdown, this coming out of this, this pandemic, Lord. We give you glory for that, Lord. But we want to be so prepared for whatever is coming next in the world, whatever birth pang is next, Lord. We want to be so prepared for it, Jesus. So we ask the Lord to strengthen us in this next season to strengthen us, breathing back. Let us not get comfortable again, Lord. But let us be pressing on in your face for your glory. And preparing the way for your return, Jesus. As we look upward, as we watch, and we wait, and we pray with you, Lord, you will come and you will shoot across the sky as lightning shoots from east to west, Lord. And we will be gone right there. Praise your holy name until that day comes. Let us fight the good fight, not relying on our own or anything of the natural, but relying upon you. For you will do it in us and through us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's keep worshiping.